This week is Parshas Vayikra. And I am coming to you from a very special location. I am right now in Jerusalem, and I am just several feet away from the holiest place in the world. I am by the Kotel, by the Western Wall, and I decided to come here and give a special edition of the Parsha podcast for the listeners. I was not planning on giving a a podcast this week because I'm out of town, but I came up with an interesting idea over the weekend that I thought I would make a podcast and come to the holiest or close to the holiest spot in the world and share it with you, my dear listeners. Just as an aside, people always say that the Western Wall is the holiest location in Judaism. It's actually not true. We believe that on Temple Mount, where the Holy of Holies was, that's where the holiest place in in the Jewish world is. As opposed to the Western Wall, the Western Wall is nothing more than a retaining wall that is holding up Temple Mount. It's still a very holy place, and we're very fortunate that we're able to come visit. Many generations and many centuries, Jews were not uh, so fortunate. But it's not the holiest place in the world. It's a very holy place because it's right next to where the Holy Temple was. Now, why am I in Israel? The reason why I'm in Israel is because my eldest brother, Eli, he made a wedding for his daughter. So my niece got married on Thursday. And therefore, to join the festivities, and I'm here for a couple of days. And over Shabbos, they had the Sheva Brachas, which is the seven days of celebration after the wedding. And of course, Shabbos is the peak of the celebration. And that was celebrated in Jerusalem. And over the course of the Shabbos, they had many many talks, many speeches that were, people were giving. And the, the aim of these speeches is to give a nice idea, maybe on the Parsha or on marriage. But you have the bride and the groom, and they're there for you know, the first week of their lives. And if people could share with them some insights, some wisdom, some guidance, uh, then they do that. So even though this week is Parsha's Vayikra, I'm going to share with you an idea from last week's Parsha, which was Vayakel and Pekude. Uh, which were the last portions of the book of Exodus. So the end of the book of Exodus, the last five sections, last five partios, talk about the Mishkan. The Mishkan is the tabernacle, and the last five portions deal with the instructions that the Almighty gives Moshe, first to assemble the materials needed, all the gold and all the silver and all the special jewels and, 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 and precious stones and fabrics and use those to build the various vessels for the Mishkan, for the tabernacle, and for the vestments of the Kohen Gadol. So the first, so Truman Tetzava talked about the instructions given to, the, given to Moshe to build all these things, and the execution of those instructions are done in the last two, in the, in the Parsha that we just read. And there's an interesting verse that we find in chapter 35, verse 27, that talk about the role of the Nisim. The Nisim are the presidents of the tribes of Israel. There's 12 tribes, and each tribe has a, an emissary, a representative, that represents the tribe, and they're, so to speak, the leaders of the tribe, and they contributed like their fellow Jews. Everyone came together. Moshe made a huge fundraising call to raise all the materials needed for the Mishkan, for the tabernacle. And everyone brought the gold, the silver, the jewels, and all the precious stones and uh, the fabrics. But in verse 27, we're told what the Nisim brought, what these presidents of the tribes brought. And the verse reads that the Nisim, the presidents, they brought the Avni Shoam and the Avni Miluim. What are these Avni Shoam and Avni Miluim? These are the precious stones that fill the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol, of the high priest, and the apron-like afo that attaches on the shoulders of the Kohen Gadol. There's two stones, one on each shoulder. Each one of them lists six of the 12 tribes of Israel, and those stones, the stones of the breastplate and the stones on the shoulders were donated by the Nisim. That's what the verse says. And Rashi points out something very interesting. Rashi pulling out a subtlety uh, in the actual way the words are spelled, Rashi notes that the verse is criticizing these Nisim. 
Why? Because the word, the Hebrew word used in the Torah to spell their names is lacking a letter. The word is spelled missing a letter. Now, Hebrew, it's somewhat fungible whether or not you put in certain letters because unlike English, the Hebrew vowels are invisible. However, that said, in certain instances, the vowels are in the form of letters. So it's somewhat confusing if you don't read Hebrew, but if you do read Hebrew, you'll, you'll recognize that there's letters and there's also what's called nikudot, which are the various dots and dashes that go above and below the letter that teach you how to read it. And those are essentially in place of vowels. However, there are some words that the vowels are presented in the form of letters. And the word vahanesim, the, the presidents, normally it's spelled with a yud, with a letter, the letter yud, and in this verse it's lacking, it's missing the letter yud. So Rashi notes that whenever the Torah deducts a letter of a word, it's generally conveying a certain displeasure. It's, it's not happy with the Nassim. And Rashi asks the question, what, what did these people do wrong by donating these stones for the breastplate and the stones for the shoulder pads of the, of the aphod? What did these Nassim do wrong? So Rashi explains, because they made a calculation. These presidents of the tribes, when Moshe went, sent out the fundraising call, they said, you know what? We're going to wait to the end. We're going to see what everyone else donates. And whatever is missing will make up the difference. That's what they said. And then the people were so generous and the community rallied behind Moshe's call that everything was donated. And therefore, there was nothing left for them to donate. No gold, no silver, none of those other metals. There was nothing left but the Avni Shoam and the Avni Milun, but these stones. And therefore, in order for the Torah to convey its displeasure or its critique of these Nasim, it deducts, it removes the Yud from the word. That's what Rashi says. And Rashi also adds that later on, there was another second separate fundraising call and the Nasim, the presidents, they actually jumped ahead and they donated before anyone else because they had learned their lesson. That's, that, that's what Rashi says. Now, I think there's an Im- Im- interesting question, or two, two interesting questions here uh, to ponder. Number one, Rashi, quoting reports from the Talmud, is leveling criticism on the Nasim. Why? They should have not waited to the end of the shift, donated something earlier. That's the insinuation. Uh, however, if you just read the story, it seems like they had a plan, and their plan was to wait to see what wasn't donated, and then to donate that. That was their plan, and it seems like it worked to perfection. Yes, they weren't able to donate the gold and the silver and everything else, but they were able to donate the Avni Shoham and the Avni Muluim. Those were not sent in by the people. And therefore, it seems very clear that what they had a plan, and they followed through with the plan. They were planning to fill up whatever was lacking, and this indeed was lacking, and therefore, they filled it up. They, they donated it. So why is there a criticism here on the Nasim that they made some sort of huge mistake that they did not donate for the Mishkan earlier? They waited till later. Well, it seems like their plan worked out. That's question number one. Question number two is that if you, if you read Rashi, it seems that they made a donation, but their donation was too little too late. It was a flawed donation. However, the word that the Torah uses to convey its criticism of the Nasim is not the word that they gave, that they donated, and therefore their donation was lacking. Instead, it was Vahanasim and the presidents, which seems to imply that there wasn't anything wrong with their donation per se. Instead, there was something, that, something wrong with their leadership qualities. These were flawed leaders, and therefore the Torah says... Uh, we're going to call you Vahanasim. You are the leaders. You are the presidents. However, we're going to give you a slight rebuke by deducting one letter. It seems more appropriate if you're going to try to convey some sort of displeasure with these people because of their donation. Their donation was too little too late. It would seem more appropriate to remove the word from the word hevi or from the word they brought, which is the word of the verb of their donation, to say they brought, but their bringing of the donation 
was not complete, was not perfect, was done improperly, and deduct a letter from that. Why does the Torah choose to remove a letter from the word Vahanasim? It seems to imply that there's something wrong with their leadership credentials. That, those were the two questions that I, uh, that I think are worthy of noting. So I, wanna, I wanted to suggest two answers. Answer number one is that what is the role of a leader? A leader is someone who is a role model for the people that they are leading. If you have constituents and they're following you, they look up to you, they look at you as someone who is supposed to show them how to to behave and you're supposed to be a guide for them. And therefore, the proper relationship between a leader and a follower is that the leader does something and that shows an important lesson to the followers. And the followers, well, they, they copy and they emulate it. Here, what, what should have happened, or the, the criticism perhaps is, yes, of course, individually, these Nassim, these presidents, they give a very generous donation. They gave these very expensive stones for the breastplate and for the aphode. Of course, there's nothing wrong with their donation. The donation was fine. It was very generous. However, they made a mistake in their leadership qualities. They should have donated something and shown their constituents, this is what you do. Here's gold. You have gold. It's precious. It's valuable. Maybe it's an earring. Maybe it's a nose ring. Maybe it's a bracelet. It's something that you really hold. You cherish. Take gold and give it to the coffers of the Mishkan. Take your silver and give it to the coffers of the Mishkan. Take your precious and expensive Garments or expensive materials and give it. And then say, okay, you do the same. That's what a leader needs to do. They themselves, they give a very generous donation. If everyone gave as much as they did, they would have more than enough. However, the mistake that they made is they didn't realize that your job is to initiate as a leader. You're supposed to be the role model that everyone else could follow you. And because the donation that they gave was totally divorced from the donations that were given by their constituents... All their constituents gave all the gold and all the silver, but only they gave the stones of the Choshen and the Aphod. That demonstrates that there's something wrong with their leadership. That was my first answer that I wanted to uh, posit. And I suggested a second answer, and that is that a true leader knows the qualities of the people that they lead. And these Nisim, they had made an assessment. They had judged the situation. They said, there is no way that our people are going to be this generous. There's no way. Look how much gold motion needs. Look how much, look how much wood and expensive wood and precious materials. There's no way that these people, we know them, they're not going to donate. There's going to be so much left over and we'll cover that. And herein lies the flaw with their leadership. If you're a true leader, you had better be very attuned to the qualities and to the positive attributes and to the positive characteristics of the people you lead. If you don't know the inner workings of your underlings, how can you possibly be an effective leader? And therefore, the Torah, again, is not criticizing their donation. It was very generous. What the Torah is criticizing is their leadership capacities. A true leader is someone who is attuned and aware and and keenly aware of the good and bad characteristics of the people that they are leading. The story is told about my grandfather's Rebbe, Rabbi Rucham Levavitz. He was the head of the Mir Yeshiva. And during World War I, there was a lot of chaos in that part of the world and the Yeshiva disbanded temporarily. After the war was over, and the chaos subsided, he went and reestablished the yeshiva. And it was told that within three months of his reopening of the yeshiva, the yeshiva had burgeoned to around 250 students. Within three months, Rabbi Rucham Lavavitz, the head of the yeshiva, was able to delineate the positive characteristics of each and every one of his students. And for most of them, also their negative characteristics. He was so focused, laser focused on understanding the pupils in his charge that he made an effort and with, of course, tremendous ability of uh, character assessment, 
he made the effort and was successful at determining the good and the bad qualities of, of his students. And thus, if you really know the characteristics of the people you're leading, you're able to effectively guide them. You're, you're able to be a, an effective leader. The Nasim, they gave a very generous donation. However, the criticism on them is that their initial skepticism of the generosity of their people is something that warrants rebuke in their leadership characteristics. And then I added, I concluded uh, my talk by taking these two ideas and deriving from them important lessons to make our marriages as good as they could be. The first lesson was that to be a leader, you have to initiate. You have to say, I'm giving gold, you give gold too. And additionally, we're told in many Jewish sources that a bride and a groom are compared to a king and a queen. The idea being is that they're leaders. And if they're, if they're a king and a queen, they need to learn the role of leadership. And then I spoke, I turned to the groom, I said to him, Zevi, I'm going to give you some advice. And it's just free advice that will make your life better. And I'm guaranteeing that every single married person in the room, and there were about like 70 married people in the room, will agree to me. And then I told him, I said, in marriage, you know, sometimes things are great and sometimes things are not great. But regardless, if you sit around waiting for your spouse to do something nice for you, and then you'll do something nice for them, be it a nice word, a nice compliment, a nice gift, a nice kindness. If you're, if you're waiting to do that and they're waiting to do it for, you, for you to do it, so you're waiting for them and they're waiting for you, you both might be waiting for a very long time. And as time goes on, there is resentment that sets into, into place. Instead, you should follow the role of a leader. And you should say, I'm going first. And if I go first, invariably, they'll go second. That's just the way it works. And all married people know that. If you do something kind to your spouse, invariably, your spouse will reciprocate and do something kind in return. And that's just a good, a good lesson. What did the Nassim, where did they go? They should have donated first, and then that would have spurred the nation to donate. Yes, the nation donated anyhow, but something was lacking in their leadership qualities. And thus, marriage as well, if you want to be a true leader of your home, regardless if you're the spouse, either spouse, the husband or wife, the bride or the groom, you have to take initiative and go ahead first. That's the first lesson. The second lesson uh, to answer, to explain where the Nassim went wrong is they didn't recognize the qualities of the people that they were leading. And I told him, and him and her, Zevi and Shoshana, I told them that one of your responsibilities as a spouse is to learn about the person you're spending your life with and to learn about their good qualities. And the verse tells us in the book of Genesis, in the end of chapter 24, that the reason why Isaac loved Rebekah is because Isaac recognized the qualities of the woman that he chose for a wife. And because he recognized the qualities of her, therefore he loved her. What the verse is telling us is that directly commensurate to a person's understanding of the scope and the breadth of their spouse's positive attributes and virtues, the more you recognize the good of the person you're married to, the more you love them. And if you subsist and you say, you know what? I only, I know they're a good person. Maybe they have a few good attributes, but I'm not going to dig deep. I'm not going to burrow in and say, what can I find that's good about this person? If you don't do that, your marriage at best will be stagnant. And at worst, it'll just start to regress. And therefore, we have to follow the, follow the lesson here about true leaders. True leaders are always looking for the positive characteristics of their spouses. And I told them a story about the great late Rosh Hashiva of the Mir, Rabbi Chaim Shmulevitz. And he said an astonishing statement about what he knew about his wife's positive character. He said, I know thousands of good midos, of good attributes that my wife has. What this means is, is that every person, we, we, we're all a collection of good and bad character. That's well accepted. And of course, it's well sourced in Jewish sources. 
But it's not just that there's maybe two or three or five good characteristics. It's that there's maybe hundreds or even thousands of aspects of a person. A person in Jewish sources is synonymous with the world. Adam olam katan. The human is really a small world. There is so much there. It's limitless. So people have thousands of characteristics operating within them. And we have to try to find with our spouses all their good characteristics or as many as we can uncover. And the more we uncover about them, the more we will love them. And thus, if we take these twin lessons of leadership from this parsha, from this, this portion, we indeed uh, will hopefully have, you know, we'll become, we'll become good leaders as parents, as spouses, in our community, and we won't suffer uh, from the same criticism that was levied upon the Nassim, the presidents of Israel, in their donations to the Mishkan efforts. Regards to all the listeners from Jerusalem. I thank you all for listening. I hope everyone in the United States and throughout the world is doing fantastic. If you have any questions or comments, do not hesitate to email me, rabbiwolby at gmail.com. All the best. Until next time. Shalom.